Xian is a computer linguist and a member of Per Soldering. Sebastian Yirkuc is has been active in the topic of fair electronics for many years and Lara Pfennigschmidt is currently writing her master's thesis and works on Fairtronics for a job and they will give this talk about how to rate the sustainability of electronics and how public data can be used to find the material footprint of an electronic device. I am very glad about this and say, have the stage for your talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, me, Seba, will begin. Thank you to the text and the introduction. Uh, not, not that easy. Welcome for, to everyone. We will introduce you to Fairtronics, which is a software product to analyze concretely electronic hardware and specifically uh, where the resources are coming from that are in there. And we do that because of this year. These are kids here working in the Democratic Republic of Congo. They are uh, breaking down these rocks. This is cobalt ore, and uh, that is something that uh, Amnesty International showed a couple of years ago, that a lot of the cobalt used uh, in batteries that we use, mostly in car batteries, but also in smartphones and such. There um, is always child labor involved in the supply chain. So, uh, for example, in Papua New Guinea, uh, this uh, woman's home here burnt down because uh, there was money found, well, <laughs> not really money, but gold was found, which now a, a big company will mine that uh, made a contract with the, the area and so they have to be evicted, which is also a classic topic in uh, resources for electronics. These are just two examples. Uh, for why it might be interesting for an elect electronics developer to look into where their resources are coming from. So that's why we invented Fairtronics, because we want to have like for concrete um, devices, this is a spe specific mouse with specific ingredients and parts, and uh, then we can, based on the data we have and also some estimation, but also a bunch of sources, Maybe we can find out how much child labor and um, eviction is involved. And that all can go into a report. Uh, maybe a bit more concretely here. We uh, want to show with one specific example how we get to our conclusions and how we use the data that's available. So to be clear, there, there might be a device. So we look at the devices. We need to know the devices. Maybe the, the manufacturer knows that. Maybe we can um, disassemble it. And we have to find out what materials are used, plastics and metals and ceramics and stuff like that. And then those again are made from raw uh, resources like um, mineral oil, like cobalt ore, uh, crude oil. And uh, these all come from specific countries and then for each country we have specific risks involved. But we want to look closer at the stuff that's circled in red here, which is the transition from um, parts to materials. The interesting thing is that some manufacturers actually tell us what is in their parts. This, for example, is a little resistor that uh, this uh, manufacturer, Borns, which is a US American manufacturer, um, it tells us that this thing has, um, it, it weighs 2.24 milligrams. In total, you can see here at my mouse pointer, we know what ingredients are in there, which materials, and don't have to go into everything. And we can see the, uh, the percentage by mass. So this is just for one manufacturer, a, a family of uh, resistors. This is a, a fa an entire family of metal film resistors. There are also some other resistors from this manufacturer 
But now our problem is that Borns is not that important of a resistor. But one of the ones that actually published this data, there are a lot of uh, manufacturers, um, maybe also in the mouse that we discussed earlier. And we can't really use the data from this resistor. But a bunch of resistors, uh, a bunch of manufacturers actually use these full material declarations, short FMD. So this, this link often doesn't exist. So we're using a trick. So we use the, the part properties. So if we have a specific part where it isn't published what materials are in there, but we can use the properties of the part. So this is an example. The Vichy, which is a popular manufacturer, uh, has a Zener di diode here, uh, a standard part, and there's a data sheet for it here. And uh, data sheets are published everywhere for, for selling, selling the part, but uh, it doesn't list uh, what materials are used. But these data can even be uh, queried electronically. Uh, on the right here, for example, using Octopart, uh, which has all of the data for all of the parts in there. For example, this um, the, the package is listed and the weight, which is a bit different. And those exist in different uh, grades of quality. But this we can now use by using these material properties to then guess the materials on the basis of the information that we have from other manufacturers. So this exists, but only from a, a few manufacturers, uh, the, the, what's circle green here. And then the other thing we also have, the other green, green circle thing, and now we have to deduce the red circle part from that. All right, I will uh, get into the technology a bit more now, how we uh, can figure out the material composition from a new part. So, for now we need some sort of um, basis of data from where we can actually uh, use this, like some parts where we already know the material composition. And uh, we uh, did that with crawling. We assembled a database there. There are a few manufacturers that actually uh, publish these FMDs. And you can download them by hand or maybe scrape them automatically. So we focused on two manufacturers, which is uh, for one NXP semiconductors and TE connectivity. NXP uh, uh, makes FMDs for uh, CPUs and diodes and semiconductors, while TE usually does uh, plugs and uh, cable systems and stuff like that, which is very different. So the crawling is mostly done with Scrapey, which is a, a Python library which uh, ran on an external server. So the programming effort for this kind of crawler is not that uh, big uh, if you use a, a crawler like this. So this is easily expandable into more manufacturers, but for now we stick stuck with those. But uh, this can take a lot, a lot of uh, runtime, um, because especially if you don't want to overwhelm the manufacturer servers. So we had like a week of runtime for some of them, but we are very uh, uh, content with the uh, data we got, with this 200,000 XML files and uh, also 7,500 uh, 7, FMDs in PDF format, which we couldn't scrape that easily. Okay, so now we want to look at what does this kind of MF FMD look like. So for each FMD, we have a, a part maybe, which might be a resistor or a chip or a capacitor. So this might also have um, even more parts, like subparts, and then these subparts might be from homogeneous materials, like metal alloys or like bronze or, so, or solder or maybe uh, plastics like nylon. And then there are other chemical substances like gold and copper, maybe salt and water and um, plastics. So these usually have a number associated and uh, when we can use these identifiers 
we generally get to about a thousand uh, different ingredients there. And then there might also be others that don't have a number assigned, but this is how many we got. So the, for the homogeneous materials, we get about 8,000 different ones. And then there's about 20,000 parts that we have. So what do we do with this now? Because 20,000 parts is a lot. And when we want to compare them, maybe, and maybe find out which part is the best one, then we don't want to look at every uh, all the 20,000 parts. That's why we um, tried ourselves as at clustering to uh, reduce the data down, and maybe we can like collect them together from from uh, manufacturers that maybe because to resist us from a manufacturer are very uh, similar. Maybe we can only look at one of them, stuff like that. So based on the material composition, we try to cluster these parts together. So we did that with cycle learning. Uh, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> Wait. Um, this is the kill means algorithm mostly uh, from this library. So and then we did that with a on a server that has a GPU, which is um, has an interface uh, where we. And then we could use some GPU algorithms and data structures to do the collection. And then based on the material composition, we did the clustering. OK, now we can look, go one step ahead. So the last thing that's missing is the comparison between two parts. And for that, we now want to make a similarity heuristic. And so the properties of these parts we now have to look at. For this, we have the Octopart API, where we can uh, go with a part number or name, and then we get an answer with all of the technical properties of the part uh, and the textual descriptions, the images, the data sheets, and some manufacturer information. We had about 3,000 parts from the 20,000 that didn't have any technical data associated, but only 250 that didn't have a description. And often then in the description there's a lot of information, for example, the resistance of a resistor. So often the, the descriptions are an alternative source of information that uh, can be used even better to find out more of the technical information. But for now, we only stuck to the technical properties that are listed in the database. And uh, there are lots of different ones, and they are very uh, broadly distributed. And so now we want to look at these properties. So there are four different ones. There are numerical values, there are numerical values with units, there are categorical values, and then multiple ca uh, a list of categorical, categorical values. Then for these numerical values, we have like actual numbers, like the number of pins or connections. So for these kinds of attributes, uh, we probably want to have a value between 0 and 1. So we can use a, a part of that. So we take the, the smaller divided by the larger. And then for numerical values with units, that's a bit more difficult. That's where we have stuff like megahertz or kilohertz for frequencies or voltages or maybe even negative um, temperatures. So these have to be cleaned up. We have to maybe remove the units. We have to recalculate uh, different uh, units uh, to make them comparable. And we don't maybe want to have the, the negative values, so we have to move that into the positive. But um, then we can do the same thing to create similarity values between 0 and 1. And then the categorical values are stuff like um, how is this plug made? Maybe uh, what gender does the, the plug have, for example? Or is a, a file, uh, is a part uh, compliant or not compliant with a certain standard? And other regulatory stuff. And there we can just uh, check for equality. If, like, if they're equal, it's one, and if they're not equal, it's zero. And if we have multiple categorical values, 
then it's often like uh, what kinds of connection types does it have or storage types. Some maybe have Ethernet or HDMI or USB or whatever. And then we can uh, look at the, uh, the cut uh, set and um, divide that by the combined sets of the two. And then, so for every property, we now have uh, a value from 0 to 1 for the similarity. And now we can take the average of all of these similarity values. And then we have uh, still a value between 0 and 1 that tells us how similar these two parts are. So now we only need how many parts um, we now have in our um, assembly. And so we could do this with all of our parts to do a complete uh, comparison. But this would, would take a lot, a lot of time and a lot of computation. And hopefully it won't stay with the 20,000. So this would get very impractical very quickly. But so this is just an upper bound basically to see what kinds of uh, comparison strategies there might be. So the, the lower bound is a random choice where we could just choose one other part and um, compare to that. Couldn't, can't really get any easier. But uh, ideally we want something in between these two bounds. So we do a subsampling. Uh, we are looking for a subset of the parts and we'll then see what kinds of parts are the, the best fit for the properties we need and uh, then use those for the material properties. So as an alternative, we can have a look at the centers of each cluster because we know that those parts represent the cluster very well. And so we can reduce the search area like this way quite well. So there will be a nice graphic here. Okay. So on the x-axis we can see the number of comparisons that were made and on the y-axis how uh, many percents of the materials were correctly guessed. So we can see on the bottom left the random choice which only makes one compar comparison but we finished the line of, to make this visible better so it's uh, around 30%. Um, of uh, guessing the part correctly, which is not very usable, but a complete comparison does like around 75, which is pretty good, but uh, also takes a lot of time. But the subsampling and clustering are lying somewhere in between. But we can also see, and we can look at this slide here, that all of the methods are better than the random comparison. So this is very good. We also see that there is a, a lot of quality if we only do a third of the comparisons, around 6,000 of the 20,000 parts we have, which is also very nice. But we also see that the clustering does, isn't that great um, because that's below the subsampling. And this can mean that the cluster center points don't represent the technical properties of the cluster very well, but only the material composition. But it can also mean that the subsampling um, just uh, got some better data by randomly. So this is something where we can go into the analysis even more, or we can just say that we will just use the subsampling approach because it's um, less complicated than finding a better clustering. Okay, so this is basically what we did. So let's uh, put it all together. So from a new part, we wanted to figure out what the material composition is so we can do this social analysis of the part. So what we can do is we uh, put it in a re request with Octopart for the part and we get the technical properties of the part. And using these uh, properties, we can then uh, look into our database of uh, parts with already known material compositions, we can compare those with the other properties and we can then figure out a part which has the most similar and the most fitting technical properties. 
And now this is just an assumption. This can have a lot of errors, so because we're guessing around a lot. So ideally, there would be another way, which is that the part would just uh, the part manufacturer would just publish their material composition, because then we wouldn't have to do all of this um, way around. But uh, also, the results would be much more accurate, and uh, we could focus on the social analysis of the part. So that's all for the technical part. Yeah, okay, and that's where I will take over for this um, general stuff in the end. So the idea of these Fairtronics is that we put a, a list of parts in and we get a risk um, determination out of it. And now this is based on a model that um, uses that uh, and that uh, sees the, the risks of uh, each part. And that's where we had this view from earlier. So what do we do with this model? Um, the original thought that was that Fairtronics should be a tool to design electronics. To, so that people that uh, are thinking about how fair this thing might be in the end. So you can choose the right parts to make the device as fair as possible and also during the design um, figure out and uh, determine the impacts of uh, these parts. And also the second thing is that uh, Fairtronics also wants to do some more education. Especially in education it's uh, great if one has some model devices that uh, can be played around with where you can change around the parts involved in the in the assembly and um, figure out what different results would result from the use of various resources so maybe if if I uh, pay attention to certain uh, certificates on parts or if regulations change so this is a, a big thing we want to do. And so otherwise, Fairtronics in a very big context is in um, the, the big journey of the human um, society. And so there's an example here. There's a human-wide project that um, wants to maybe um, ensure the uh, well-being of the humans on the, on the world. And so this is a big transformation that can only work, uh, in our opinion, if it's based on data. So for the sustainability relevant um, decisions, uh, shouldn't be made in just uh, and aren't just made in one place. They are made in uh, lots and lots of heads in ten thousands of organizations and um, governments. And all of these people need access to data that they need to make these decisions for themselves uh, in terms of sustainability goals. And so this is both for uh, big corporations as well as individual hackers in their hackerspace and everything in between. And if one looks at the state of this kind of sustainability data, then there are a lot of problems that uh, one often has somewhere else as well. Lots of things are just in PDFs and are hard to extract. The, the tools you need of, for the data are often proprietary. and the databases uh, where this data should be listed are licensed and expensive and some data isn't even accessible at all because they're uh, company secrets and one has to sign NDAs or something that you can't publish this them, which is of course something that hinders us from actually using this data to for public service. It results in this data only being available to the people that actually have the, the expertise and structures and the money and for licenses and such. And one thing that we would like to 
give everyone is that maybe think about this this topic uh, about data sustainability. This is a very hackable topic, and it can very much need it actually. Um, the the open data thought uh, to have it in its head in your head, in, and also a term like sustainability data, which I hadn't really found on Google before doing this, and uh, yeah, maybe be involved in this kind of transformation. So thank you for all of your attention, and I'm very curious about the questions. Yeah, thank you very, very much for this very important talk and all of the effort you made and all of the background knowledge that is needed to actually uh, look behind the curtains there. And the, the open sustainability uh, term is something I learned. The questions that came up are of course that our work, this um, awareness of the, let's say, entertainment devices here, does of course leave a footprint in the world. And so there's also the question in general, in consumer heads, what we can, act, what, what we are actually doing. So one of the questions here as if there is some sort of fair trade certification uh, that consumers can use to orient themselves in the market. So, what's your opinion on that? Who wants to answer? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, as we have seen, th this is a very complex field, so there is no product that's 100% fair. So with bananas or chocolate or coffee, there are products that are certified. And I like, the, I know the idea to do this with electronics, but there is 160 or more components that go into it. And of course it should be tried. I don't want to give up. But yeah, it's not that simple. With the seal and... And there, there are some seals that go for the least evil or the least bad, so there's the Blue Angel, for example, that also includes social aspects, and then there is environmental seals, but yeah, we are about social sustainability, and so there's not much. So there are, there is the mouse that we shown. It does not have a seal, it's not certified. And of course these certifications are quite expensive. And you might know Fairphone as well. And they published a lot on the website, what they are doing. And I think that's much more believable, uh, or very believable. And we have to know this. We have to research a lot. But yeah, this is the situation in electronics. So another question. This uh, clustering algorithm that you used. So in this this question, I, I find maybe a little bit of hope. So is this clustering algorithm also applicable to different areas? Um, maybe, or did I understand that wrong? Well, it depends on the other area. Generally, yeah. It also is used in differing areas at the moment. So maybe a, a bit uh, far-fetched, but uh, for example, uh, coffee and bananas and maybe cocoa, um, maybe 
this is also in, in other material sciences uh, uh, can be used. Well, maybe to just provide context, because we didn't go into depth how it works, it's, it's a standard algorithm, basically. It's nothing complicated. You can read about it in Wikipedia. It's used in a lot of cases where you have data where you think that there are hidden clusters or you that some data points are closer to each other than others and you want to cluster them but in itself it's nothing that has a certain goal or a target it's just a tool to work with data so maybe that helps you imagine it Okay, so there's another question here uh, that you only said in the beginning that only one of the manufacturers really published this kind of data. So why are, is there only one manufacturer and could there be other manufacturers, maybe they can be convinced to also um, show all of their material data? Yeah, I just wanted to talk about this SMD resistors. There might be another one. There is not many producers, maybe a few thousand worldwide. So when we analyzed this mouse, or uh, a laptop, so 60 producers or so, we noticed, and not even 20% published their data. NXP shown by Laura, NTE connectivity, the names are complicated. Some of them are quite relevant, but especially the big ones, like Rishai, they don't do that. And how can we uh, push them? Well, they could be forced. They won't do it on their own. They won't volunteer the information, and they could. And they were asked for it for a long time, but they just don't. Those who do don't have to hide anything or are not afraid. It's just, I don't know, maybe they just save work. But yeah, there are laws coming. Yes, yeah, so some laws want to know certain materials. So you, if there's lead in there, you have to publish that. And at some point, they uh, they say, well, then let's publish everything and we'll comply with all the laws. But many don't. Nope, there's no lead in there. I won't tell you anything else. So yeah, we just have to keep uh, making laws. And put the right people in the government. Well, maybe we need a new understanding of toxicity. It's not about um, only the lead itself, but also where is the lead being mined? And how are certain raw materials processed? This needs awareness, and we need a new awareness of toxicity. And um, you've contributed to a better understanding. And as you said, there's not only the legal way, but also through your work, um, there can be a consumer force with mindful consumers. So um, I've tackled all the questions. So now I can only um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. It's been over far too quickly. And I want to also thank all of those who listened. And I want to point you to the Q&A section as well. Thank you very much.